Edward Glazer from Harvard University to present the paper, Saving the Heartland, Place-Based Policies in 21st Century America. So. Thank you, and uh, I'm very grateful to Luke for putting me on the program. Um, this is joint work. Uh, it was written for uh, Brookings uh, Papers with Larry Summers and Ben Austin. And despite the first slide, it's going to deal overwhelmingly with the US. But I think the themes of some places that have been left behind, which may in fact be associated with certain types of populist backlash, may indeed have resonance in the European Union as well as in, as in the United States. So let me start with my one uh, European slide here, which is uh, a picture of European density and its relationship to both earnings and population growth. So the blue line that you're seeing here is average GDP per capita across the NUTS three regions, where I've ordered the 1,114 NUTS three regions on the basis of their density levels. And what that line shows is that the densest tenth of Europe's regions have incomes that are about 100% higher than Europe's least dense regions. There's just an enormous difference in this. There's, of course, a vast literature that my discussant has been a major contributor to on agglomeration economies and trying to estimate the extent to which this is actually a treatment effect of density, or this reflects selection or omitted variables which both attract population and uh, generate productivity. But it does certainly, without any doubt, point to the re stark reality of enormous differences in wealth across place within the, within the EU. Um, the red line shows the relationship between population growth between 2000 and 2010 and uh, initial population density. Uh, so whereas uh, you know, in the US in the 19th century, we left our dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans. The generally rising slope of that line shows that instead of spreading out, at the start of the 21st century, we appear to be clustering in. Uh, I will tell you, this graph for the United States has a flatter line linking density with incomes, and of course, a much steeper line linking population growth with density. And these population growth density relationships, of course, reflect greater migration, not greater fertility in, in, dense, in dense areas. Um, I'm going to be particularly focused on one type of spatial heterogeneity today and thinking about policy responses to it, which is heterogeneity in not working rates. So I'm not going to be looking at unemployment, which I think has become an increasingly misleading figure about the state of labor markets. Uh, I'm going to be looking at one minus the EPOP ratio, so the, the not working share. And I'm going to focus primarily on, on men, almost overwhelmingly on men, simply because the labor force participation number for women is just more complicated. And it just doesn't have the same, doesn't have the same meaning. And many things about it are different. Um, what you see here is the total not working rate between 1980 and today and the share of Americans who have been a share of American men, prime age men, who have been not working for more than 12 months. So when I was born 51 years ago, less than 5% of prime age males uh, were non-employed in the United States. For most of the last decade, more than 15% of non of uh, prime age males have been unemployed and uh, have been non-employed have not been employed so that really is a huge change in the US and it of course moves with the cycles but after every cycle it it fails to come back in the in a, in a full way um, and I think the the rise of the long term not working is is particularly striking in this way America is becoming more European in a, in a sense um, there's heterogeneity across space this is the difference between this is the epop rate for metro areas and for non metro areas and what you can see here is that the non metro epop rate is considerably lower than the EPOP rate for metro areas. So the non-metro EPOP rate for the US has been under 80% for the past uh, couple of years. So you have more than a fifth of Americans, uh, prime age American males who are not working in these locations. I want you to visualize it, though, even more clearly. So this is a map of the United States. And the darker areas are the ones with higher uh, joblessness rates for prime age males. Um, the really dark things have numbers that are over 25%. Um, so what you can see here is a broad band that begins in Mississippi and Louisiana, heads up through the Appalachians, and ends in the Rust Belt, which is the epicenter of American economic despair. So this is the eastern heartland of the United States, and it's an area that sort of has been hit extremely hard and has failed to, to come back from these areas, uh, from those hits. There also is, of course, a concentration of joblessness in the West Coast and also in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. But an, two other things I want you to take away from this, of course, the, the prime coastal metro areas are quite light. So they really are very different labor, labor markets, so New York or San Francisco. But also much of what we'll call the Western heartland looks pretty good as well. So joblessness is not you know, high in the Dakotas or in Montana or in uh, Wyoming. And that, you know, that, that 
puts the lie on a simple view that high joblessness is associated with populist political revolt. Because these areas in the Western heartland where joblessness is, is quite low were also very enthusiastic voters in 2016 for the, for the more populist candidate. Um, this is the same map with the same colors in 1980. Okay, And as you can see, it's not that the correlations aren't there, but the numbers are just so much lower in 1980 that the map just looks totally different. Uh, there's no place in 1980 where you've got anything over 25% except for a tiny, tiny sliver of Appalachia. The rest of America all looks quite different. Um, this is the same map today for women. And in this case, it looks much more like a north-south divide than it does a, a divide linking the eastern uh, heartland with, with the rest of the US. So here, the northern states have uh, higher labor force participation rates for women. The southern states have lower ones. And it really seems like it's more of a straight cultural phenomenon than one that actually captures large-scale economic distress. Now, this is sort of my picture. But I want you to combine it with a view that America is becoming, in some sense, a more geographically sclerotic nation. That whereas throughout most of American history, in contrast to much of Europe, America was a, was a country in which we would move very rapidly in response to local economic shocks. Whether or not there was the declining transportation costs of the early 19th century that enabled the farmers of New England to go and take advantage of the far richer soil in the Ohio River Valley, or uh, the move to cities in the late 19th century, or the move to the Sun Belt in the, in the mid 20th century, or the move from the, of African Americans north during the Great Migration, all of this was you know, a nation that was highly on the move. For the 40 years prior to 1992, the inter-county migration rate had never been below 6%, meaning that 6% of Americans changed counties in every year, right? For most of the last, for the entire last decade, the inter-county migration rate has never been above 4%. Okay, so it's quite a dramatic, it's a, it's a third in terms of reduction of the migration rates. It's really a very substantial decline in the mobility of Americans. Um, this is not just, you know, about house lock, just, just so you know, the, the decline also shows up in renters as much as, as owners. It's a sort of larger scale cultural phenomenon. When we do see migration, and this somewhat, you know, makes it difficult to think the right answer is just to build more homes in New York City or greater San Francisco, and I do believe that's part of the answer, but migration also comes with a curse, which is it is strongly skill biased in a way that leaves the people left behind with even fewer uh, high human capital people around them. And if you believe that skills are an important determinant of the long and success of localities, the out-migration of the skilled is particularly troubling. So what you're looking at here is along the x-axis is the share, these are for Pumas, public use microsample areas in the US, the share of college graduates from among the non-migrants, and along the x-axis are the people who left that Puma five years ago, sometime in the last five years. And as you can see, particularly among the less educated Pumas, that the out-migrants are much more educated than the people who stay there. Okay? So that, that's the difference between the dot and the 45 degree line that you, that you see that. So, so there really is a, a very severe de-skilling that occurs without migration, which makes it hard to think the right answer is just we should make it easier for people to build housing in San Francisco and, and let them all move there. That may be a, an attractive long-run solution if it ever could be remotely feasible, but at least in the short or medium run, it leads to a hollowing out of the places with it, that the skilled leave behind. There are added changes that are important. One fact which is associated with Peter Ganong and Danny Shoag is that migration has, has not only declined, it has ceased to be directed to high wage areas. So historically, Americans had moved to places that had higher nominal incomes, higher nominal, not, not worrying about the CPI, but worrying about local price, price indices, right? That has really changed, okay? Particularly for less skilled Americans. So there's no sense in which the migration rates of Americans are any more particularly targeted towards the high wage parts of the US. Secondly, successful areas have made it increasingly difficult to build low-cost housing, right, which leads to, to a spatial mismatch of the United States. Right? And this is a point that I made 13 years ago, and Shea Moretti attempted to put a quantification on it. But some significant fraction of US GDP is probably lost by the fact that we don't allow people to build in the areas that are more productive. And of course, that is one explanation of why we no longer move to the productive areas, that when you know, the farmers moved, moved west in 1830, they could build balloon frame houses for pennies on the dollar in, in cheap areas. Today, it's, you know, you want to build a starter home in, in Palo Alto, it's $5 million. Um, OK, three, uh, I think I'm actually underestimating this. Uh, the, the, um, there's a strong correlation between the change in the share of the population with a college degree in an area and the initial share of the population with a college degree. So you can see this. Moretti originally identified this in 2004. And you can see this quite strongly in the data. And the last point, which I, I sort of really want to emphasize for this, for, for anyone who's sort of more macro-oriented, is that income convergence at the local level has stopped. 
In fact, the last time that we saw it was in 1990, and then Barrow and Sally Martin wrote their paper, and then it went away. Uh, but uh, it was a phenomenon in the US for 130, 140 years, uh, but it really has ceased to, uh, ceased to, ceased to be. And just, just if you remember all of those, those graphs from Barrow and Sally Martin that showed just a powerful negative effect, this is what that graph looks like. So it, today, 1980 to 2010, so it's still slightly negative, but if you do even the slightest thing to correct for the measurement error-induced uh, mean reversion, like, for example, instrument for the median earnings with the 75th and the 25th percentile earnings, this becomes positive. Okay, so mean, mean, re, mean reversion at the income, of income levels at the local level in the U.S. really has stopped being a phenomenon. And even more striking is the persistence of not working rights, the persistence of joblessness. So some of you may remember Table 2 of Blanchard and Katz's paper from uh, the, Brookings, the Brookings papers from 1992 or so. Panel 2 showed a stark relationship between unemployment at the state level in 1985 and unemployment at the state level in 1975. There was none. So it really led to the view that America ironed out its unemployment rates incredibly quickly. This is what joblessness in 2010 looks like when regressed on joblessness in 1980. Okay? That's a correlation of over 80% and a coefficient of more than one. Okay? So there's no sense that America's high joblessness areas are somehow or other disappearing. We have become a nation in which these, these things are much more fixed. Last point I want to make in terms of preliminary facts um, is just there's a reasonable view that not working is a much larger social problem for men than purely low incomes are. So we've worried a lot about inequality over the past 10 years. We've worried much less about the rise of joblessness among prime-aged men. Uh, there at least is some data which suggests that the problem of joblessness may be a much more severe social problem. I, I have, I'm a big exponent of the view that, that we should never use happiness data and think that we're capturing utility, right? We, there's no reason why human beings should maximize happiness, uh, and you know, there's no, not a clear sign that we do. Um, but the fact that the uh, non-working men are so much less happy than the working poor, and this is what this shows. So, you know, if you ask what share of the population is dissatisfied with their lives, earning more than 50K, that number is about 2%. Earning between 30 and 50K, it's 4%. Earning less than 35K, it's 6%. Non-employed, 18%. Okay, uh, uh, quite a large difference. And it's particularly striking if you look at those who are both not employed and working alone. So you remember 2% among, among the employed males who are earning more than 50K. What's the number for long-term unemployed who live alone? Over 30%. Okay, so this is a, this is a phenomenon that's associated with you know, social isolation, a deep sense of purposelessness in, in the world, and a deep amount of, of misery. There are some other uh, in, attendant things that go along with this. This is the geography of opioid deaths in the United States. It doesn't match perfectly the joblessness rate, but it certainly is suggestive, right? So that, this, that this drug, uh, these drug fatalities are, are linked with this. Divorce rates, suicides have all been linked to joblessness in a serious way. And of course, you know, the government spends where the people are, are jobless. So this is a, a US government expenditures on a per capita level across states. And again, this matches up reasonably well with Eastern Heartland. Um, just to show you a couple of dynamic facts here to simplify things and not give you the, every state in the union, I'm going to just carve things up into the eastern heartland, the western heartland, and, and the coast. And my definition of the east versus the west depends upon when the state was admitted into the union. Uh, so pre-1840, you're in the east. Post-1840, you're in the west. Um, this is joblessness by the three regions. So the eastern heartland has been above the other two regions since the early 2000s. And then again, it was in the 1980s. Uh, the gulfs are, are between the eastern heartland and, and the, the western heartland, which is the biggest difference. The coasts are actually between, is about you know six or seven percent in terms of the joblessness rate overall. Um, if you want to look at the three regions, um, all of them have seen their GDP uh, go up, of course, uh, in real dollars, but the growth rates have been much faster in the coasts and the western heartland than they have been in the eastern heartland. That comes from two separate phenomena. What's happened in the coasts is that GDP per capita has gone up faster. Right? And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, the coastal states are the, are the blue ones, and they're the ones with faster GDP growth per capita. The western heartland is barely ahead of the eastern heartland. But in terms of total employment growth, it's hard to make it out from this graph, but the, but the rate of growth in terms of employment has actually been a lot faster in the western heartland. So bodies have been going up faster in the western heartland. Dollars per body have been going up faster in the coast. Um, and finally, in terms of the, the trends, this is a, you know, many of you may have read the Case and Deaton paper on the stalling of 
life expectancy gains for prime age men in the US. The epicenter of that, again, is, of course, the Eastern Heartland. And that's exactly what you see. So these are, these are prime age mortality rates. Um, historically, the Western Heartland was the healthiest. Uh, the coast in the middle and the Eastern Heartland was slightly worse. For a brief period in the late 1980s, early 1990s, associated with both crack cocaine and uh, AIDS, the coasts went above. Uh, the Eastern Heartland in terms of prime age mortality, but now the coast and the uh, Western Heartland are both much lower, whereas the Eastern Heartland has been treading water or even slightly rising for at least 20 years in terms of mortality. So it really is a, a deeply troubled region. I am not going to try and sell you on any particular story for why the Eastern Heartland looks different or why joblessness has increased in the US. There's a very nice survey paper by Catherine Abraham that attempts to decompose how much of this is about labor demand and how much of it is, is forms of labor supply. Um, she finds more emphasis in favor of, of the, the labor demand side than the labor supply side. The labor supply side is both about various federal government programs, which make not working less painful, but also the ability of friends and family to provide support for non-working men. And you know, 35% of non-working men in our sample are actually living with their parents. Okay, so th there's a fair amount of family transfers that are going on uh, in various ways. Um, I have a simple two-factor model of economic growth that I always carry around in the back of my head, which emphasizes the combination and interaction of education uh, and institutions. Um, and these are areas which, both of these areas are areas in which the Eastern Heartland has lagged. It's traditionally been a less educated area, and here you can see the, that this is true in 2015 as well. And this reflects two different phenomena. In the southern states, this is the legacy of slavery and the Jim Crow South, where there was less investment in education because it was a highly agricultural area and schools were seen as being a potential route towards rebellion. In the north, this is the legacy of the industrial past, that you know, workers could get good jobs working on the assembly line and didn't need to get college educations uh, to do it. The western heartland, by contrast was the birthplace of the American high school movement, uh, and the Western heartland has typically been actually better educated than the coast, um, historically. So this is the sh prime, college, uh, prime male college education rate in the three regions. As you can see, as of the late 1970s, the coast and the Western heartland were about equal. If I went further back, the Western heartland would be ahead. Um, over the past 30 years, the coasts have surged ahead. The Western heartland has been relatively stagnant, but it's still above the Eastern heartland, and the Eastern heartland is caught up. And I don't know if that means that the next 30 years will be better for the Eastern heartland because its education is coming up, or the next 30 years will be worse for the Western heartland because their education has lagged behind. Um, there also is at least some suggestive evidence that the institutions of the Western heartland are, are the institutions of the Eastern heartland are somewhat weaker. Um, I wrote a paper maybe 15 years ago called Corruption in America, where we use um, federal charges against local officials for corruption violations of, the, of federal, federal uh, um, law. Um, these tend to be concentrated in the Eastern Heartland. So Mississippi and Louisiana, for most of the last 30 years, have routinely led the, the, the beauty contest as being the most corrupt places in the US. And this is from a more recent paper by Liu and Mixell, which sort of shows, again, that the Eastern Heartland is, is, has this institutional problem. And there's a, there's a bit of speculation in the paper about why the institutions would be weaker in the Eastern Heartland. Um, this shows occupational licensing. The pattern uh, lines up a little bit less, less well, um, but at least there's some suggestive evidence that, that at least this type of excess of regulation, perhaps excess of regulation of, in this case, this is a state regulation of opticians. So those are not the guys who actually check your eyes, who one can reasonably argue would, should be licensed. These are the guys who tell you whether or not you're you should have ground glasses or square glasses. Uh, so, you know, the regulation presumably makes sure that you don't have someone recommending you round glasses when you should have square glasses for your eyes. Um, okay, now all of this uh, leads us to the question, is geographic sclerosis, is the hardening of America's geographic mobility an excuse for revisiting place-based policy, just as the more, the greater sclerosis in the EU was always seen as at least something of a justification for place-based policies in the, in the EU. Okay, so let me just go through the reasons why for most of my career I have argued strenuously against place-based policies of any form, particularly the large infrastructure ones advanced by the EUs. Counterargument number one, subsidizing declining places keeps people in dysfunctional local economies. It's not false, but this becomes less important with lower migration rates and somewhat less important if you're particularly worried about the out-migration of the skilled. Counterargument two, subsidizing any place leads to capitalization in rents. The poor, tenement, the poor tenant, meaning the poor renter, who doesn't like contemporary art may be, well be worse off by, because of the Bilbao Guggenheim, right? Uh, the, the rents went up, they, didn't like the, they don't like Gary, and you know, it's, uh, again, as people are less mobile, this would be less important. The relative importance of capitalization versus distorting migration depends upon the elasticity of supply of housing. 
So if you're looking at a declining place like Detroit, where essentially you're on the vertical part of the supply curve, meaning that they're not building any new housing and it's just declining, um, are places in which you expect it to show up in capitalization rather than distorted migration. Places where more elastic, you expect it to show up in terms of migration. Counter argument four, some place-based policies can create pockets of high unemployment and low human capital. This is still true, but presumably doesn't need to be. It depends upon the design of the strategy. And counter argument number four is that when infrastructure gets decided not on the basis of rigorous cost-benefit analysis, but based on myths of, of place-based rebirth, all sorts of horrors can occur, okay? Well, that one's still true, okay? So this is the Detroit's Peeper Mover monorail, right, built in the 1980s, um, which as you can see from the, from the picture, it glides over essentially empty streets. Okay, um, the, the, you can run a bus at any speed you want in Detroit. It's a city that was built for 1.85 million people. It is less than 800,000. And the fundamental fact is that the defining feature of declining areas is that they, population declining, is they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the number of people, relative to the level of demand, right? More than 90% of the homes in Detroit were valued by the market at considerably low construction costs in 1980. It never made sense to have policies to subsidize housing in Detroit. And it certainly doesn't make sense to subsidize a monorail that uh, that, uh, of, of this form. Now, the case for place-based policies, right, um, has, there are three elements of it. The first is about various forms of local externalities, okay, which is, you know, the decentralized spatial equilibrium is unlikely to be a Pareto optimum. Um, so agglomeration economies are generally accepted, at least by people who, you know, uh, are, are in this, in this world. Uh, a typical number would be we think that D log income or D log uh, value added, uh, D log uh, productivity per D log density is like 0.06. That would be the sort of number, okay? Congestion externalities on the other side are also quite real. There are a variety of different estimates of those. Um, human capital externalities may be more contentious. Uh, but uh, certainly, if you believe any of the, the Moretti numbers, they're big numbers, right? So they're potentially quite large. Typically, as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings go up by 10% as well, holding your years of school in constant. Now, that's more bedeviled by the selection of high human capital people into these areas. But um, these externalities mean that a decentralized spatial equilibrium is unlikely to be a social optimum. But as I, I argued in a Brookings paper 10 years ago on these things, uh, that doesn't mean that we know how we should actually want to shape people, shape the, the, the movement of people. So it is certainly true that we're probably not at, a, not at an optimum, but unless you know not just the existence of these local externalities, but the full shape of the curve, I don't know if I want to move people from West Virginia to New York or New York to West Virginia. There are externalities from both, from both moves, and knowing that there is a, a spillover from this productivity is not enough to know the direction of where that externality is larger and where I should shape people around, right? I don't believe that we are ever going to have good enough sources of exogenous variation to pin down these local externalities to be confident about the shape of these things enough to move people around, right? So I, I basically think that, you know, we just can't use this as a justification for place-based policy. It's often advocated, but we just don't know enough about whether or not, you know, where, where we're going to be gaining welfare triangles and where, where, where we're going to be losing them, to be at all confident that we're going to be gaining versus losing by trying to, to move people around. Place-based argument number two, which I have no argument with in terms of the logic of it, is just an insurance, or if you want to be Rawlsian about it, you know, a behind the veil of ignorance kind of equity argument. Um, so in 1969, Detroit was slightly richer than Boston. Today, Boston incomes are 40 percent higher. Surely insuring individuals against shocks to the local economy would be welfare in, in, enhancing in some ideal world. It's almost impossible to think that that wouldn't be. Of course, there's some counter move in terms of the cost of living, but you know, the, the, for the owners of Detroit real estate, that counter move isn't exactly a plus. Uh, it could be pretty non-distortionary if based on place of birth, um, although place of birth is pretty inconceivable as a, as a you know, policy outcome. Um, a related argument is that place itself may be a marker for low income and in some cases less distortionary than low income itself. But the big limitation on this is that the only really natural political unit on which you could base these insurance levels are states. And states account for a very small amount of the variance of incomes within the United States. About 1.2% of US income variability occurs at the state level. So even if you could wipe all that out, you're achieving very modest welfare gains for a huge political lift of actually making this thing occur. Now, of course, if you could go down to micro levels, if you could go down to Pumas or if you could go down to blocks, then you get a much higher variance. And indeed, the recent work of Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren shows us that you get a significantly higher R squared, maybe 9 or 10% going down to the block level uh, based on birth. But how could you possibly imagine an effective effective government policy that, that bases things on block of birth. Um, 
So that brings me to the long, the third argument, and that's the argument I'm going to try and advance, which is that there are different labor markets within the, the U.S. I am sure there are also different labor markets within the EU. Right? Different labor markets with different elasticities call for different social insurance policies and call for different employment subsidies. Okay? That's just a flat out application of you know, any sort of formula that you want for this. If you have a different labor supply elasticity in one place than another, you're going to want different formulas. I'm going to try and put some numbers on that going forward. But let me give an extreme example of, of the need to have sp place specific policies when we know elasticities are different. The US government has a uniform federal construction subsidy in the low income housing tax credit. Right. There's a reasonable argument that this tax credit is, is Pareto improving in places which have artificially constrained housing through local regulations. So in New York, in San Francisco, in LA, it's not a crazy policy. In a city like Houston, where there's essentially completely elastic supply of housing, these added subsidies are clearly related to one-to-one -one crowd out. They're clearly doing absolutely nothing to, to housing supply. And it would be crazy in a, in a city like Houston to think that you actually wanted to subsidize it. In Detroit, there may not be any crowd out because you wouldn't build without the subsidies, but, um, but it's, it's clearly not optimal uh, either because you don't want, you don't want more housing there. Um, example number two is hot spots policing. You, there's a long claim in the policing literature that you want to throw the cops where the crime, are, the crime is. Similarly, you want to subsidize employment Right? or design your social insurance policies more in places where there's more of, a, more of a response to that. So if you have a limited pool of employment subsidies, you want to throw it in places where you think those, those subsidies will have, uh, have, have more effect. So the argument is that in high employment markets, policies that deter employment may not matter. In high non-employment areas, policies that deter employment may have awful consequences. So think about a $15 minimum wage in Seattle versus West Virginia. Right? So it's going to be tiny in Seattle in terms of its effect, as, as recent studies have shown, and perhaps massive in West Virginia. Um, so the question that we ask now is, is the marginal impact of an employment subsidy higher in West Virginia than in Seattle? And this is just my view of the world. I have a distribution of uh, the net return to working, right? and it's, it's moving around over space. I've got, and I've got you know, the places that I have, lots of people who are not working. The, the density is higher. That's just my view of the world of this. Now, um, the, the, uh, there's, there's so the explicit spatial proposal, right, is that we want to, um, you know, we want to subsidize working more in places where the response to that subsidy is going to be larger. The nice version, which I associate with my always generous and kind co-author, Larry Summers, is that he wants to just hand out more money in places where, you know, we think the employment response will be larger in places like West Virginia. The mean version is I'm going to take away something else and effectively tilt the benefits. So I'm going to do more to subsidize employment in West Virginia and do less to subsidize non-employment. So as you think about it, you can do this in a way that's actually spatially neutral in terms of where people locate, but just work a tilt that responds to local labor market conditions. Uh, and that's the mean, that's the mean version of, of it. Um, I do have a point that I, I don't, wouldn't trust the locals to do this because it could easily lead to a race to the bottom where you try to deter poor people from coming to your areas. So we now do a bunch of different work on trying to estimate whether or not there are greater responses to a variety of labor demand shocks which are seen as being mimicking you know, what would an employment subsidy look like in places which have higher levels of joblessness in the US. So we do this with three, three things. I'm not going to walk you through the numbers. But they all give, give figures which roughly point in the same direction, although none of them are, are you know, completely nail this. And I think this is really an invitation for more work, not, not a claim that we finished it. One of which is just the classic Bardic industry composition shock interacted with national trends. This shows the Bardic shock. This is 19. 77, I think, to 2006. And we're interacting the Bardic employment growth number uh, with the historical not working rate. The thing to pay attention to are these negative coefficients, which tell you Bardic is reducing, the positive Bardic shock is reducing uh, non-employment more in places that have high historical non-employment rates. Um, this is, and it goes in the opposite direction on housing prices. This is, the Puma, this is at the Puma level, again, uh, a strong negative interaction there. This uses uh, Otter, Dorn, and Hansen shocks. Again, in this case, the shocks are, are, have the opposite uh, sign. These are positive shocks. But again, they have more of an effect on, on not working. They have more of an effect on joblessness in places that have high joblessness levels to begin with. Third shock is the Na Nakamura-Steinson shock that comes from federal spending. Again, they have more of an impact on joblessness in places where, where the historical joblessness level is high, which shouldn't surprise you. When, when everyone's employed, the impact of a labor, de labor demand shock on employment is going to be zip. Right? In places which have a 30% unemployment rate, you'd expect to see a larger thing. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this data. So you know, 
higher joblessness areas seem to have higher joblessness responses to various shocks. Now, we then, in the paper, modify the bailey chetty formula in a way that tries to incorporate this. And we then are going to, you know, you end up with a formula that relates the marginal utility of consumption in the employed and non-employed state with a formula that takes into account what you think the employment response will be to a more generous payment to being non-employed. Right? So you plug in this elasticity uh, into this formula, and you get out predictions about what things should look like. We then calibrate this. I'm running out of time. Um, and the, we're going to be calibrating this off of an externality from not working, which is just based on the fiscal externality of not working. So lost taxes, increased government benefits. So our, ex our excuse for an employment subsidy is just straight Pigou 1912. You've got, you're going to subsidize employment because there's a, there's a welfare loss that, that you're not incorporating, which is the fact that you're imposing costs on the government by not, by not working. If we wanted to throw in the cost on your parents as well, depending on how well you think cozying, cozying bargaining works within the household, then that number would be much larger in terms of the externality uh, of not working. Um, we're going to use uh, CRA preferences and range of values for risk aversion. And this basically gives you what the ratio of the, this is the employment subsidy relative to wage, should be based on how responsive things are and based on how risk averse uh, you are. So the, the more um, risk averse you are, so the higher gamma, the less responsive you have. The more you want to keep those employment, those consumption levels constant, obviously the, more, the, the less concave you are. Uh, the more comfortable you are having, having larger differences. We calibrate this using the, uh, using the, the Bardic shocks to get these different elasticities. And the type of thing we get is that the, um, let's say if you have a coefficient relative risk aversion of 1 or, or 0.5, uh, you get in Wyoming, which is a very low uh, non-employment rate, your consumption when non-employed is supposed to be 92% of your consumption when employed, as opposed to 72% in West Virginia. So it implies, at its most extreme level, a fairly large gap between the states in how, much, how nice we should make working versus non-working, depending on because of those very different labor supply responses in those, in those areas. Um, so as we push towards a full-bore spatial policy, I think the right answer is that both uh, social insurance policies like disability, like UI, should take into account local labor market conditions and in some sense should do less to subsidize not working in places where the not working response is larger. Um, we should have um, employment subsidies that are larger in those areas and probably place specific educational interventions, although I don't really have time to discuss that, uh, and things like place specific regulatory reform. Uh, I don't really have time to reflect on US EU differences. Uh, the case for EU spatial policy was always somewhat stronger than in the US, partially because migration rates are so much lower, and partially because you know, just the difference in climate between two areas of the US is just so, so much smaller than it is in the US. Um, yet, in, from your perspective, many of the social policy decisions are based at the nation state level rather than the ECB level. Uh, nonetheless, I hope some of this will be useful for the EU context. Um, and just I want to end on a caveat, which is you know, as much as I'm arguing for place-based you know, heterogeneity in thinking about insurance policies. I am not engaging in a full-throated support for any of the large-scale place-based policies that the EU has advanced over time. Right? Uh, and the possibility for waste from these policies is enormous. Right? So you know, even when they work, Right? So, so Guggenheim Bilbao is a spectacularly successful museum, but you know, Bilbao's unemployment rate is still 19%. Right? It didn't fix unemployment in Bilbao. And like, that's a good museum. Right? That's, that's choosing the max in terms of the quality of success for, for a local cultural thing. Right? Anyone remember Sheffield's National Center for Popular Music? Right? That one was also a place-based intervention that closed within the year. Right? So again, you know, have policies that are targeted towards local conditions, but don't think that you want to arbitrarily pour money into areas where that you can magically, by spending in an area on a museum, cause some area to reverse its economic trends. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have the discussion, Diego Puga from SEMFI. <coughs>
we have this perception, you know, stuck back in 1992, uh, not just uh, Barnes and Martin, but also, oh, sorry. Uh, partly from Barrett Salomon Martin, but mostly I think be, uh, from Blanchard and Katz, that migration was a very effective adjustment mechanism for regional inequalities in the US. Whenever there's a negative shock, uh, people moved out uh, and things adjusted fairly quickly. Uh, and also, more generally, worries that in any case, anything that we do in terms of place based policies are going to shift things around from one place to another without really having a big aggregate, uh, aggregate effect. Uh, two things have changed recently. First, the magnitude of both gross and net migration flows has dropped. Uh, and I think this, this is a point that uh, Ed has stressed a bit more in the, in the presentation. Maybe in the paper I think it would be worth pushing this a bit more. The fact it's what's important is not just that migration flows have, have fallen, but the fact that there's le they're less directed, right? So, of course, you could have a, a fall in migration, but still, if you know, the net effect is that 2% of people are going towards places that are growing, you can still have adjustment, right? The key here is that not only overall flows have fallen, but actually they're less directed than they used to be, and this is a point that's been made clear in the, in the presentation. And second, there's been this rapid rise in, in the share of uh, prime age males specifically who are not working, and this is a, a rise that's concentrated in the eastern heartland of, of the US. And the authors argue that this may make place-based policy something that it's, uh, they're worth uh, reconsidering. Right? So, uh, of course, it's a very useful paper. First, because it, it brings attention to uh, this uh, fact in the US that disparities are, uh, are rising and migration is falling. And this is something that, you know, if, if you think about uh, non-working rates, I think there's some broad awareness that this is happening, but probably much less so is that this is a, a phenomenon that's geographically concentrated. And also, I think in terms of migration, we still tend to think of, of the US as a fast adjustment, high migration country, and maybe we're not so aware of this uh, fast decline that's been happening. The paper also has a very careful discussion of what is needed for uh, place-based policies to make sense, and this is something that I think is, is you know, that there's lots of literature discussing place-based policies. Most of it, uh, almost all of it, is not, not nearly as careful, right? So just to give you an example, this argument for, uh, for agglomeration economies as justification for place-based policies, well, you know, as Ed has made clear, what you need for place-based policies to make sense because of this is not that there are agglomeration economies, but actually that there are different across space. And we really know there are agglomeration economies. We have a good sense of the magnitude. When you get in terms of spatial differences, that's a much more difficult thing to assess, right? And he stressed, you know, the need to know uh, about differences in, in agglomeration economies. In fact, you also need to know about differences in congestion costs. And this is something that we know even less about, right? How fast is uh, congestion going to rise in San Francisco if we uh, let more construction take place? Uh, is it, you know, how, how fast is, uh, we really don't know, uh, e even less than with agglomeration economies. Also, the paper is useful because it has a, an empirical analysis of whether the key conditions are met. In particular, it looks for evidence of heterogeneous employment elasticities. And, you know, uh, the, the evidence is just suggestive, but at least, you know, it's making an attempt uh, to get some numbers on that. And then finally, it has a balanced discussion of the potential uh, place-based policies that you can have. So it looks at different alternatives, looks what, what policies make sense, which uh, don't make sense. Uh, feasibility, uh, politically, in terms of magnitude, uh, different alternatives, right? So it's, it's a, I think, a very, uh, very useful contribution in, in that sense. The paper, so you know, l let, me, let me then spend most of the discussion just giving, in, giving you some, some, both some additional comments, uh, maybe a few uh, European uh, numbers or, or, or more Spanish numbers you will see than, than European generally. Uh, and just some quick reactions, quickly partly because you know, I've, I've only been asked to discuss this over the last few days. So uh, it's been a, a relatively, uh, I had read the paper before, uh, fortunately, but uh, it's been sort of a, a quick uh, putting together of the, of the discussion. Uh, so, you know, starting point is that non-working rates in the U.S. are high and they're heterogeneous. So they've gone up from around 10% in 1980 to close to 20% uh, today. With, and they're also, you know, they're heterogeneous. So you have huge differences, like, you know, around 50% in Flint, Michigan, 5% uh, in Alexandria. This contrasts with this perception of the U.S. Uh, as, you know, a, a country where, uh, you know, non-working rates are low. And, you know, it's, you think of the levels. I mean, just getting to Spanish kind levels of, of non-working rates, right, which is, which is quite amazing, right? So the non-working rate for prime age mills in Spain is also about 20%. And differences, you know, the comparison of differences is not, 
not quite right because I'm doing this at the level of uh, autonomous communities uh, as opposed to finer areas as there. But, you know, there's also a broad range, you know, going to close to 30% in Andalusia versus 10% in, in La Rioja, right? So this is not just that there's a rise in these differences. The levels actually are getting up to the levels of high unemployment in European countries. Uh, and it makes sense to focus on this, partly because, you know, I, I agree with that, that the line between being unemployed or being a, out of the labor force is really blurred, right? And we see lots of people crossing that line uh, frequently in the data. Um, there's also this evidence that uh, in terms of, of, of happiness, in terms of well-being, uh, uh, non-working might be uh, more relevant than, than the level of income. And in any case, even if we worry about income, not working is going to be a big component of income inequalities, right? In the case of Spain, for instance, there's this recent paper in the EJ by my former colleague uh, Stefan Bonom, now at Chicago, and, and Laura Spido from the Spanish Central Bank, showing that the rise in uh, income inequality in Spain after the Great Recession is mostly due to uh, non-working rates. In particular, lots of prime-age males with low education levels who are working in construction, getting you know, around median income, who have dropped out of the labor force. Uh, so you have this, this hollowing out of the middle of the distribution, but it's happening through precisely non-working rates. So even if we, if, we, even if we care about income inequalities, non-working rates are going to be an important component of that. So this is the, the drop in migration rates uh, in the US, just taking you know, the lower chunk of that uh, diagram in the paper. You can see the, this fall from around 7% for a long time uh, to under 4%. Uh, and you know, a, a first, uh, uh, Thing that you may think when, when you uh, look at this kind of picture is, well, if part of what's been happening is that adjustment has slowed down, we have this fall in migration rates, shouldn't, before we start thinking about place-based policies, shouldn't we think about how to recover those migration rates, how to get them high again and, 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 and maybe recover that adjustment? So why are migration rates low? Well, you know, I, I, you know Ed, uh, out of all people, have been, has been telling us for uh, about this for, for 10, 15 years, how important regulation is in preventing uh, uh, high potential growth cities in the U.S. from growing uh, even more. Uh, however, I think you know, that there's some perception uh, that uh, this, uh, this kind of regulation is something that you, know, you have some fast-growing cities like San Francisco that have high regulation, other fast-growing cities like Houston that don't. Actually, no. You know, I, I want to just show you quickly a few pictures showing that this regulation is something that's systematic, right? So this is a picture of uh, um, house prices uh, as a function of distance from the center of the city for different uh, American cities. Some things here, I think you would expect this from a standard urban model, a monocentric city model, right? So of course, you know, uh, house prices decline with distance from the center, uh, prices at the center are higher in bigger cities, bigger cities expand further, what you really wouldn't expect from a standard urban model in this picture is the fact that not only prices at the center of the city are higher in bigger cities, prices at the periphery, at the edge of the city, are also higher in bigger cities. And this is not something you would expect in a model without regulation, because the price of land at the edge of cities is very similar across the US. Construction costs are also not very heterogeneous. So unless there's big differences in regulation, you wouldn't expect this. And you not need not just big differences in regulation, but this regulation to actually be systematically related with uh, the size of different metropolitan areas. And in fact, that's what you see. So if you plot the house price in the periphery more generally against population, you get this very clear positive relationship. That's been driven by stronger regulation in bigger cities. And as you can see by plotting this Wharton regulation index against population, again, a very clear relationship. That regulation is keeping periphery prices high, that you see here. And as a result, you know, whereas normally you would expect if house prices go up in some region, the construction is going to react by building more there. If you look at construction against periphery prices, you basically see no relationship, okay? So uh, there's really an important limitation imposed by regulation on, on the expansion of cities. Now, can we fix things by, by addressing this? I don't think so. I don't think so because, first of all, few people who are not working move to look for a job elsewhere. This kind of migration is something that, as economists, we like to think a lot about. We have very nice models, like Kenan and Walker, looking at this sort of thing. In practice, uh, you know, uh, less than 6% of all moves across U.S. states, less than 3% of moves within state are by people who don't have a job and move to another place to look for a job. Okay, so this is just a very, very small fraction of migration. If we free up uh, housing in cities, the high-skilled are maybe going to move there and take more advantage of this. The not working are really not going to react a lot to, to this, I think. 
Okay? And also, you know, if we look at this drop in migration rates, we saw this picture for the US, you know, I can show you the picture for Spain. It doesn't look very different. Okay? And here we don't have the same set of differences in regulation across cities, right? So it must be something else also that's driving this in, in part. Okay? Uh, still, you know, uh, this doesn't mean that there are no gains to be made from, uh, from uh, freeing up regulation, but they're not for the kind of problem that we're looking at today, this non-working non rates. Okay? Um, how about other barriers to migration? Well, you know, there are certainly uh, local welfare benefits, housing vouchers, locally administered federal programs, those sort of things. Those sort of things uh, probably uh, are deterring mobility. Now, given that those you can describe as type of, uh, of place-based policies, uh, does this mean that this is an argument against place-based policies? Well, not generally. What this argues against is uh, place-based policies that are based on residence. You don't want that sort of thing because that's precisely going to deter mobility even more. But I think the paper is clear about that. It's not pushing for residence-based policies. Rather, it's, uh, it's uh, pushing for policies that are based on where you work rather than, than where you live. And, and that's not subject to the same caveat. Okay? Um, so you know, let me just uh, end up with a few, uh, a few uh, tweaks, I think. I, I think I agree generally with the message of the paper. Uh, so what I have are, are more uh, tweaks a bit on, on the emphasis and, and, and things that I maybe are worth looking at a bit more. So I think the paper exposes very clearly the symptoms. I think it, it really doesn't take a very clear stand on, 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 on where the problem is coming from. I think that's partly because it's a very difficult issue. So, you know, non-working rates rising is a very important problem, but it's something that we don't understand very well. But I think it, it, it might be useful to take a stand of where it's coming from, and especially where differences and where this concentration is in Harlan are coming from. So I think you know, the paper provides some evidence on this. I think at the end of the day, the authors are, are telling us a story about the combination of, of negative employment shocks uh, with, uh, uh, with low education. Uh, but I think it's probably worth making that more explicit, just taking a stand and saying this is, this is what you have in mind, if, if that is the case. Uh, also, the paper focuses on distant heartland. Now, in the presentation, Ed gave us a different cut of the data in terms of large metro areas versus uh, smaller metro areas and, and non-metro areas. I think, not as a substitute, but as a complement, it might be useful to look at things that way because this may be also largely not so much a problem of just the eastern heartland versus the rest, but maybe large metro areas versus the rest of, of the country. So maybe I think that that cut that you made in the presentation is actually useful, a useful one to have as a, as a complement. I think it's also important to understand what is the market failure that we're trying to, to address, right? So there's certainly a discussion in the paper of why workers prefer not to work rather than, than working for low wage and why we don't have more mobility of, of uh, non-working prime age males. Uh, but, you know, why is economic activity not going to distant Harland? I think this is important to, to, to think about and to understand if we want to think about what kind of place-based policies uh, might work. Um, the paper uh, makes an effort to try to assess different elasticities of employment, and for doing that, it, it does three exercises. It analyzes military spending shocks, okay, and that's, that I think is, is very relevant, and it, it's, it's careful, but it's probably something that's, uh, I think, and I think the paper is also clear about that, it's something that's relevant for thinking about that kind of program, but not so much transferable to other kinds of welfare programs. Uh, it talks a bit about you know, where we would really want the evidence to come from, which is looking at the past, looking at uh, place-based policies that have been implemented in the past in different regions, and seeing whether the effects have been different, depending on the area. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of literature there, uh, and there's little they can do more than calling for more work in the area, right? So given that that work is not there, they turn to some analysis of, of uh, essentially Bartik the Mac shots or, or the China syndrome kind of shock uh, to look at what the elasticity might be. Now, this is, this is nice and interesting. My, my worry with this is that the fact that some place got hit harder from uh, rising imports from China, or the fact that you know, some decline in, in, in traditional manufacturing has hit more uh, a region where there's a concentration of uh, high, uh, a high concentration of non-working uh, prime age males, that doesn't necessarily mean that we subsidize employment there. It's going to react more, right? Because maybe the, some jobs were lost in traditional manufacturing, the workers that were working there who lost their jobs uh, have low education. Now, if we subsidize jobs, maybe the jobs that are going to be created are not going to be the same type of jobs. Maybe the jobs that could be created are not suitable for this kind of workers with low, uh, low education. So maybe the effect is really not going to be the symmetric one to this negative shock, right? So, uh, you know, it's suggestive evidence, it's interesting, but I worry about drawing the elasticity out of that to design the, the and I think that's, that's my main caveat in terms of the, of the analysis. Then I'll finish with this. 
if we think about the different kinds of, of policies, I think uh, I, I, I basically fully agree with that on the first two. So in terms of uh, targeted location decisions for public employment, I think they're possibly effective, but the scope is probably not going to, to be something that gives give big effects, and I, I think we, we agree on that. In terms of infrastructure, uh, I think infrastructure can be very useful. We have evidence that it can have large effects, but I think there are two reasons why this is not the route uh, to, to go. Uh, first, the, you know, although we found, uh, the literature has found uh, big effects of infrastructure in the past, I think there are no projects like you know, building the interstate highway system in the US or electrifying the, the Appalachians that are, that are going to, uh, to, to be left. So as we build more and more infrastructure, the marginal products have smaller and smaller effects. But also this kind of uh, place-based policy that tries to help areas by building big infrastructure, whether it's that uh, uh, modern music museum in Sheffield, or whether it's, it's uh, 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 high-speed trains that go to, to nowhere, these things are not very effective, right? And one way to, to see that is if you, you know, if you look at uh, work in urban economics, looking at the effect of highways, whether it's run Turner Turner or, or Nate Bump Snow, there they worry about the endogeneity of infrastructure, the fact that you might build more infrastructure which is most needed, and for this reason, you might want to instrument for uh, for infrastructure that is actually built. In fact, when the instrument for infrastructure, they find that the IV effects are not smaller than the OLSVEX, they are greater. This tells you that you're building more infrastructure, not where it's most needed, but where it's less needed. It also tells you that those projects that you build in areas where it's not needed have very little of an effect. Okay, so there's really not a big scope, I think, for fixing things by building lots of infrastructure. Uh, so that leaves us with employment subsidies or education retraining. The paper focuses more on, on the subsidies. Uh, you know, my caveat there is what I mentioned about the elasticities. I think I would probably put a, more of a, a bit more of a focus uh, uh, on education retraining. And here, let me, and then let me finish with the, just with, the, with this comment. Here, you know, my, my worry, this is not a worry about the paper, this is a worry about my own statement about focusing on, on, on retraining, comes back to the picture that that shows us, showed us about uh, corruption and the quality of, uh, of institutions, right? Because if I think of, of my own country, Spain, and the effort it's, it's making on, on retraining, we have this, again, high non-working rates, uh, people who are working in construction, who are, have low education. We now have, you know, this worry that uh, increasing worries that our vocational training programs are not up to standards, certainly far away from what's been done, for instance, here in, in Germany. So there's been some, some work towards making those, those programs more relevant to skills that are needed in the market, to uh, things that are more reactive, where firms are more involved. The, you know, there's no systematic work yet comparing uh, how this is happening across, uh, across Spanish regions, but you do have work on specific programs in the specific regions. My reading of the literature is that this has been very successful, precisely in regions that are really doing relatively well, like the Basque Country, where they're very careful to involve the firms in terms of seeing what skills are needed. They react very rapidly, so we're missing this kind of programs that have this skill. Okay, so let's do some courses that do that, and they react very quickly, and that has a very big, big effect. Whereas in other regions, precisely the ones where this would need to be more effective, where non-working rates are higher, you know, this is much more detached. Programs have been designed like traditional programs without really thinking about what is really needed. Uh, and then uh, the rates of people who actually find a job and then stay in a job for a long time are much, much lower, right? So here the devil is in the details, and I worry that precisely what is needed is uh, quality of institutions that's correlated with non-working rates. And I'll finish with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's collect some questions from the audience. Yes, here. Second row. I have one question, uh, like, how uh, Ed, do you think about uh, how the sort of great recession fits into this picture? I know that mobility rates, based on your picture, start decline before the great recession, but obviously great recession is associated with millions of foreclosures, decline of housing wealth. A lot of these regions, I presume, when you have high share of uh, 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 people that are, that are essentially not working, were also fairly heavily hit by recession. So to what extent this is also like a story of a decline of housing wealth and credit worthiness that prevents migration to better places in the sense that, A, if I suffered foreclosures, my credit score is very impaired, my credit card lines get cut, so I'm sort of, instead of moving to a high productive place, I'm going to move to a place that's like incredibly cheap, but they're also not maybe jobs. B, if I'm really a young male and my parents suffered foreclosure or, for example, their house is worth way much less than it was and it's slowly recovering. They cannot really help me financially 
to move to a better place and to what extent this is partly an artif partly this is an effect of the great recession and the slow recovery okay. if you could hand over the, the mic yeah. and then and then to the back right. um, there's a complementary set of facts uh, I think relevant to your analysis that involves the general decline in labor market dynamism, that is job to job transitions have steadily fallen. So the question is, could the decline in migration contribute to the decline in job to job transitions or how much could be the reverse, the decline in these transitions could affect migration? Okay. If you could just pass on, thank you. Hello. Um, so you've shown some trends and some facts about the uh, not working population, and you used these uh, trends and facts to justify maybe some um, place-based uh, policies. Uh, the not working uh, variable is as a big uh, advantage. It's very well defined. It's binary zero one, uh, but it has a disadvantage of leaving out of the analysis the working poor. Uh, people, uh, if you add those people in, in your analysis, the working poor, uh, does the picture uh, change a lot? And um, do your arguments for place-based uh, policies uh, um, weaken or are they stronger? Other questions at the back? Uh, thanks a lot. The one dimension which you just briefly touched upon is, especially from a European perspective, the heterogeneity of state policies. So if you look at, for example, California, they are very effective at moving people from their own state unemployment insurance to the federal disability insurance, while some of the states that are actually in your eastern heartland um, are not even making full use of federal resources available to them through Medicaid, uh, through TANF, etc. So the one thing I'm wondering is, would those place-based policies that you um, advocate for, would they actually find the, the would, would there be some ownership in those states that really need them? Okay. Any further question? No? So, please. Okay, so first of all, let me, let me thank Diego for his, his usual uh, superb discussion and uh, I, I don't think we matter. We differ very much, and I just want to call it one major thing, since there are uh, maybe some macroeconomists in this in this room, that the opinion of infrastructure, right, is very different among macroeconomists and among economists who actually study infrastructure. So most of the time that one talks to macroeconomists, it is taken as sort of an unbelievable, unshakable thing that we need more investment in infrastructure, whether the US or somewhere else. I have never met an infrastructure economist who actually believes that. Right uh, now, they 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 may very well believe that we certainly need targeted maintenance expenditures where the returns are very very high. Uh, they may certainly believe that we need policies to encourage better use of that of that infrastructure. But like this article of faith that we need what we need is more infrastructure, just as clearly as we need more education. That you know that 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 is not something that's that's typically shared. I think I think Diego's Diego's comments brought that out. Secondly, on Diego's final point on education, I, I, two, two two points. One of the reasons is why we didn't. And, and emphasize education more relative to employment subsidies. The first thing is that I think for most of my life as an economist, which is about 30 years, the routine economist response to every economic dislocation is to invest more in education. Right? That does not make that wrong. Right? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's absolutely right that you know, we have good evidence on pre-K programs, but telling an unemployed coal miner in Kentucky that like you got nothing for him but his granddaughter will get a great pre-K program is not the most satisfying response politically that one could possibly do. Now, um, so I, I, in some sense, I was, I was reacting to, to you know, I, agreeing with education, but thinking that we wanted to say more. And I, I actually think that the case for, and this relates to the point about the working poor, the, the view that there is a flat-out externality associated with joblessness, which comes fiscally, and maybe a more arguable one that comes through other forms of transfers or maybe psychic internalities, if you believe in that sort of thing, um, that seems to me to call for an, an offset setting Pigouvian subsidy. I mean, that's what Pigou said in 1912, and I think he was right then, and I think he's still right. Um, so that's, that's why we are arguing that. And if, and if we supplemented that a little bit, um, the, the past 40 years of research on adult retraining programs uh, primarily in, in the U.S., is vast and dismal, right? Uh, I'm not saying that every single one has been a failure, but overwhelmingly this, this has been a, you know, retraining 50-year-old guys for new jobs is, you know, is hard. 
Um, now, Diego's comment is quite reasonable. Is it possible that you, is it possible that anyone can retrain the 50-year-old guys or use the 50-year-old guys? And I'm not sure what the answer is on that, right? We sort of know what less skilled people do in cities. They work in the vast service sector. It's less, it's less clear what less skilled people are going to be doing in, in areas that are far away from more skilled people. And whereas in the 1960s, a manufacturer would move capital to a low-wage place like Mississippi, right, to take advantage of cheap labor, no fancy Silicon Valley tech guy is going to move move to West Virginia because you can get cheap haircuts there, right? So you don't have the same sort of relocation uh, uh, that comes about this. And by the way, this, this issue also comes up in terms of the future of like sub-Saharan Africa, right? Even if transportation costs continue to fall and accessibility continues to fall, if manufacturing mechanizes sufficiently quickly uh, that the East Asians are basically able to produce at a cheaper rate, even you know, with higher labor costs, then there aren't going to be manufacturing jobs in Africa either. And that begs the question for, you know, what, what will those jobs take? But what, what will the jobs look like, if anything? Uh, I, I still think that as economists, if we see a, a market failure, if we see a Peruvian externality, we can call for a subsidy even if we're, sure, even if we're unsure about what the behavioral response uh, will be. Um, so a uh, couple of other, other points. Um, so the comment about the working poor, I want to sort of emphasize two things. We, we saw there as being, we actually wanted, I mean, we obviously want the working poor to be working less poor, but we actually think that getting people from non-employed into the working poor is actually a really good thing from, from most of the data that we have. Um, what we don't have is we did, we did do an interaction with, you know, not working rather than an interaction with any other thing about the labor market. That was fairly arbitrary. I mean, the logic of the model tells you that any place, for whatever reason, you have a higher labor supply response on the extensive margin, you want to have a higher employment subsidy. So you know we, we want to we want to identify those more more clearly. Um, the the Tomasz's point about uh, the Great Recession having some role in it surely it's some. Tomasz, I mean, surely that's some role, but the two pieces of evidence that go against are the timing doesn't quite line up, line up well. And secondly, there is all this evidence that like renters have had exactly the same decline in, in mobility that owners or past owners have or you know, permanent renters haven't. So it can't all be house lock. I mean, house lock is surely some, some dimension for this chlorosis. Um, uh, Mark's comment about sort of dynamism of, of I, I thought you were going somewhere else on this, but you're, you're about, about um, the, the movement of, of workers from, from firm to firm. Another similar decline in dynamism is the declining level of entrepreneurship as well in the U.S. And I haven't fully wrapped my, my head around, you know, how these things fit together and whether or not it's best seen as a third force, which is uh, leading to all, uh, to, to all three of those things. But they are a fascinating change and an important change in, in the U.S. I will say just one thing about looking for work and changing things. Historically, uh, you think about Americans as moving first and then finding jobs later. And that was a historic difference between the e U.S. and the EU. Whereas, like, no German is going to move from one city to the other until his job is lined up in the new city. You don't just, like, show up in Stuttgart and say, hire me. Uh, but you did for, like, decades, for centuries. You showed up in Minneapolis and said, hire me in the U.S. Now, what could be happening, actually, is that the rise of various job search platforms mean that you no longer do that. So it may all it may lead to less my you know job search led migration, but that's a that's a uh, a speculation. Uh, one last point, and then I'll, then I'll just end. Um, will states own the policies and the, the heterogeneity in state implementation and stuff? I, I don't know, and it's not quite clear. The the political path forward, which says you're going to allow some degree of state state flexibility in employment subsidies, that would be a relatively easy path forward, which is sort of similar to the path forward that we have with Medicare and Medicaid. I would worry about that. That that in fact, if you gave states these options that it would be implemented in a completely wrong manner. So I'm very skeptical about the ability of the states to do this right on their own. And I, I favor state heterogeneity, but not necessarily state control. Um, so let me just, let me just end there. And, and again, thank, thank Luke for including me on the program. See you. Okay, thank you very much. So we go for a second coffee break. Thank you. <laughs>